Sri Lanka navigating the economy through turbulent times. Now, this is the theme of this week's At Hyde Park discussion at Studio 24 of Adha Derana. Uh, I've invited to our studios to discuss uh, matters of faced by the Sri Lankan economy, the way forward and what we are to expect uh, as we move forward. Uh, in studio, joining me, we have Professor Atula Ranasinghe, a Senior Professor at the Department of Economics of the University of Colombo. A very warm welcome to you. Mm -hmm. And I've also um, invited Dr. W. A. Vijayawadana, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, joining us virtually. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Vijayawadana. Thank you very much, uh, Idhuri, for having me. Um, I, I think I want to ask um, two academics and uh, a career central banker, um, what you think is the state of the economy? Now, of course, the, the government assures that by end 2021, official reserves um, will remain above 3 billion US dollars. However, um, th th there's a lot of concern uh, in terms of Sri Lanka's reserves position, the dollar, um, the, the crisis, the, the rupee uh, scenario, and also uh, the cost of living and other, um, uh, at large, the macroeconomic situation. Um, what is your understanding and observation? Let's, let's start off there. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, uh, television program. Uh, your question is about the current situation of the economy at large. So if I try to interpret in this one word, that is a crisis. And this crisis has a several phases. We have, obviously, foreign reserve crisis. We have the fertilizer crisis, you're talking about every day, and about the fuel crisis, gas crisis, food crisis, and also new crisis is coming up, that particular called the governance crisis. Now, you can see that. That's an information crisis, obviously. You may remember yesterday, uh, Father Cyril, uh, uh, Father Cyril Gamini. Uh, Cyril Gamini. Uh, Father Cyril Gamini uh, made a statement that there is an attempt to hide the right information. So it's not giving, but that's a systematic, you know, uh, attempt to hide information from the public. So that's a crisis situation. So information crisis coming now. It's on the all in all board, and also we have. I would like to call an institutional crisis. What is the institutional crisis? Now you can see that there are a large number of top level government officers, responsible people. They are either removed or they resign, or they are forced to resign. Starting from the former governor central bank to yesterday, the secretary of the agriculture ministry, all are in a very short time period and they are premature resigned. So that is not a good symptom. I don't want to say that the resignation is a bad practice, but to sudden changes of the uh, top positions time to time on the political motives, it's uh, going to be a really a bad uh, situation. And also, you can see that uh, uh, there are strikes are going up, uh, many problems in the work workforce. And uh, finally, we also have the fundamental right crisis also coming now. Now you can see that the after this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, gas crisis, now there's a situation, there are victims of this gas crisis. And they cannot get any compensation for that. Even the gas tanks sold to the people, they are in a dangerous situation, they, they can return it. So there is no any sort of, uh, uh, you know, that's a uh, rights uh, protect of these people. So that's also a very serious fundamental right crisis. Okay. Actually, all are related to one. The start, if I look at, try to look at the start of it, hmm, right. the uh, uh, core crisis, mm -hmm. that is the, I would call it the reserve crisis or the dollar crisis, because everything is in line with that. Uh, so that is basically... Right. So uh, I'd like to turn to Dr. Vijayawadana. Now, from, uh, from a governance crisis to information crisis uh, to uh, institutional crisis as well as fundamental uh, rights crisis. Now, as, as uh, Professor Atula Ranasinghe points out, it sounds like the, the, the country is um, in, in a grave crisis. But what is your observation uh, at, at the, uh, about the country at the moment? Well, in the very, I think Atula had uh, 
very correctly diagnosed uh, all the uh, economic crisis uh, from which Sri Lanka is now suffering today. In fact, uh, the sum total of what he said, said is that Sri Lanka is in a crisis, but I would like to add an adjective as well as an adverb to that. The adjective is that we are in a deep crisis. The adverb is that actually we are moving the crisis towards uh, a point where it would be beyond redemption now. So day by day, the crisis is actually uh, um, deteriorating. And as a result, uh, Sri Lanka would reach a point pretty soon where it would not be able to uh, salvage its economy from the crisis from which we are suffering. And as uh, Atul has very correctly said that uh, the main uh, culprit, main, main symptom of the crisis is the uh, deteriorating for election situation in the country. You also had referred to it in your opening remark. Uh, our foreign resources are falling and they are falling day by day. And there is no any prospect uh, for Sri Lanka to build up the foreign reserves. So the reserves have fallen to a very critically low level at the end of November. But the central bank hopes that uh, the level might go up to about, say, 3 billion US dollars by the end of this month, uh, which is again a wishful thinking because central bank had not given any concrete uh, proposal about the about how the how the bank would be able to build it up. So if we go by the position as at the end of uh, November, uh, gross reserves have been down to about uh, 1.6 billion US dollars. Out of that, uh, we have a gold reserves of about, uh, say, 380 million US dollars, and the position with the IMF, another 120 million US dollars. So altogether, if we take it out, because these, are, these cannot be used by Sri Lanka in an emergency, if we take it out, what is available for us to use uh, in an emergency, the liquid cash available by way of foreign exchange is about 1.1 billion US dollars. When we project it to future imports of Sri Lanka, this is sufficient only for two and a half months, two and, two and a half weeks of imports uh, of Sri Lanka. So uh, we are in a critical situation, but our, uh, our foreign exchange repayment commitments are so large, uh, we will not be able to meet it unless we get a mega inflow of foreign exchange from some other source, maybe a friendly country or friendly central bank or from another source. If we get about, say, another five or six billion US dollars within the next two to three weeks time period, you would be able to go through this situation. But if you don't get it in the worry, the situation is alarming and uh, we are actually hitting the wall. So that is my uh, reading of what Atul has said and also what uh, I have observed in the case of Sri Lanka's economy today. Uh, when Dr. Vijayawadana says, uh, yes, we are in a grave crisis, we have to, um, we have to somehow find a way uh, to come out of this situation. Uh, Professor Ranasinghe, now there should be some way that the Sri Lankan economy moves out of this crisis situation. There should be a way. Um, what, what, what is your prescription? Well, uh, there are countries which have even uh, deep down in the crisis uh, much more than this, but they have recovered mm -hmm. and therefore at least some hope. So the standard solutions to this as uh, uh, Dr. Vijayvardhana mentioned, we have to find some money, as he said, that's uh, 5 billion. Mega investments. Mega uh, investments uh, is one. Mm. And then go to the IMF uh, and have some money. But and is going to the IMF a real solution? Because the current government believes yeah. in a homegrown solution. They believe that there is still space for Sri Lanka to come up with um, a, s a solution, an economic uh, a formula uh, that is more closer to Sri Lanka, a local one. Actually, uh, there is, I think there is a political economy problem with the government because you may remember that by the time of election, the uh, main slogan of the government, the present government in the election time was the uh, uh, main uh, slogan was the uh, kind of a anti-IMF slogan. So they didn't want to go to IMF. And they raised also the concerns about even now, yesterday, this morning, I saw uh, Minister Bandhu Gunardhan was talking about the, and also the Governor Central Bank are talking about the consequences, bad consequences of going to IMF. 
true. We have shrinking government argument, that is to reduce the government activities and the employment, and also uh, various compensations, various subsidy policies, and uh, exchange rate policy, all has to be relaxed if you go with the world of IMF. So there is that cost. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the old natives are either to go to some other commercial borrowings or go for a mega projects, mm -hmm. mega investments. Now, the question I have is, are we in a sort of a conducive environment to attract mega projects to Sri Lanka? Now, you see yesterday, day before yesterday, we just have shocking news about this Fitch rating. There may be something critical about the Fitch rating that, you know, we are, uh, you know, in down in the fish rating, but still it is done. Now investors come to Sri Lanka or any other country for that matter, looking at these statistics. If they see that Sri Lanka is in sort of a financial crisis situation, according to the fish ratings and other international ratings, uh, I have a doubt that whether we can attract people, uh, there's uh, investors uh, that soon. Mm -hmm. So that's that challenge, but that is also option. So government has to try it. But the problem is that now, uh, if we go to the IEMF, we have to go by their conditions. And people vote, that's a 69 million people, voted against that. They don't want to go to the IEMF. That's why they voted for that in this election. So do people like to take that challenge? Do people like to have the exchange rate relaxation and which definitely boost up the uh, dollar value, maybe uh, at least, I th I'm sure that more than 50% depletion would be expected if we just let it uh, free. And do people like that? And the other side of the story is that, hmm, now there is also a political game behind. Now see, all other political parties in the scene, except JVP, all other parties had been working with IMF up to now, apart from few individual parliamentarians, there is no any official statement that we should go to the uh, IMF. So, definitely what happened is that if the government go with them, definitely there's another clash that they start, you know, uh, criticizing and you know, fighting against government for going for the mm -hmm. IMF. Mm -hmm. So there's a political, you know, right. government has to... Regardless of what party or... Yes, uh, oh, and mm -hmm. JVP also now in a sort of a indifferent situation. Right. I before we before we mm -hmm. continue further, I'd like to turn to Dr. Vijayawadana mm -hmm. um, to ask you, um, is, is, is um, going to the IMF at this stage, uh, you say it's the last resort, but um, again, the same question, the government wants to go uh, look for a homegrown solution. Is that possible? And secondly, uh, Professor Ranasinghe was talking about uh, mega investments, the challenge posed on Sri Lanka in attracting investments. Is it that bad? Is there something we can do to work around uh, the situation to attract investments? At the same time, uh, a market determined exchange um, rate. How, how, how do you think we can approach this situation? Throughout my career in the central bank, spanning for over a, over about say four decades, I have heard this bold statement uh, being pronounced by many politicians that they have a homegrown solution. Unfortunately, today the head of the central bank is telling us that he has a homegrown solution. Finally, what happens is people they are this is like a patient whose uh, ailment is you know the deteriorating day by day condition is deteriorating day by day and once the uh, condition has reached a level where uh, you cannot treat him with this homegrown remedy at that point you decide to go to imf and that is exactly what had happened in the past except in one case in 1971 when dr Perra decided to go to imf in 1971 uh, at that point, uh, it was not actually a very worse situation, but he had said uh, very boldly, even though he was his leftist uh, minister of finance, he said that uh, Sri Lanka is a member of the International Monetary Fund, and Sri Lanka has a right to borrow money from the International Monetary Fund, and therefore the government of Sri Lanka is seeking a loan facility from the International Monetary Fund. So that was the bold statement made by Dr. Nempera in 1971. Unfortunately, today, uh, most of the politicians say that they have a homegrown solution and the governor of the central bank now says they have a homegrown solution. 
what we observe as independent economies will be very that homegrown solution is not working because the homegrown solution was you know introduced in uh, december 9 2019 when sri lanka's reserve position was around 7 billion us dollars from that day onward the homegrown solution had actually allowed the reserve levels to fall and today it has fallen to the lowest level possible uh, within the recent history of sri lanka government and really uh, sorry to interrupt uh, dr vijaywa do you think this uh, from 2019 there was sufficient space uh, given the condition now the government says uh, with the covid situation a pandemic situation prolonged pandemic situation and um, and uh, world powers the entire globe affected by this situation do you think the government had sufficient time and space to implement this homegrown solution that we're talking about well uh, in fact uh, Uh, delivery what the economic policies should be flexible even in december 2019 our observation was that sri lanka's economy was not in good health it had been deteriorating from around year 2013 growth rate had been falling uh, public debt has been rising external debt has been rising specifically the money borrowed from the commercial sources uh, has been rising uh, inflation was rising up again in the country so therefore it was uh, an ideal situation for sri lanka to seek imf support in december 2019 immediately after the present government was voted to power the covid-19 pandemic hit sri lanka only in 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 february 2020 and since then the government had been relying on this homegrown solution but in our view the covid-19 pandemic outbreak has been the best situation for sri lanka to seek imf assistance because imf has been giving the debt relief uh, facilities for the member countries and sri lanka had never applied for that debt relief facility sri lanka was thinking that imf is uh, is 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 anathema so as a result the conditions that were Uh, brought into us by the outbreak of covid-19 pandemic had been the ideal situation for sri lanka to go for this type of a uh, solution but what that happened is we had been sitting on our uh, relying on the uh, homegrown solution and now this is the situation where we have reached in my view uh, if we go to imf today it will take about say 6 months time for us to get a negotiated uh, loan facility okay. and by that it, sri lanka situation will be pretty much worse and we will not be able to recover from this right i think on that note we'll take a short commercial break here at hyde park to stay with us Welcome back, um, Professor Rana Singh. I think uh, Dr. Vijay Wadhana was talking about the current situation. What, um, even if we move uh, in for an IMF uh, uh, program, what the situation will be for Sri Lanka? But, but really, is it that bad now? Uh, I understand that both of you share similar um, uh, observations, but at the same time. uh we're moving into a new year 2022 we're looking ahead uh, after the 18 or 19 months of um, a pandemic hit period but at the same time people are looking for better times is that possible what what can we do now uh, if attracting mega investments is a challenge if managing um, the the exchange rate position given the policies as you say are not uh, conducive if that is also a challenge what is the way out for sri lanka uh, i have no short term solution to this mm-hmm. because now as uh, dr vijayvardhana mentioned now things are gone worse so there won't be any short term solution as uh, dr vijayan mentioned if you go to the imf it takes another 6 months to negotiate mm-hmm. even if you go for a mega projects there are no investors ready to come to sri lanka and you money there must be the negotiation process so that takes time to prepare the project reports there are some project reports to the government but i don't think that there are investors are uh, hurry to come to sri lanka at this moment and therefore there is no any short term solution only what the government can do is at this moment is to manage the crisis giving minimum because have given the uh, more than enough shocks to the public now mm-hmm. so managing the uh, crisis Uh, different ways until such time that we get a sort of a permanent solution. Uh, 
there's no other way around to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know whether the uh, government is ready to do it because when the uh, ministers and various other stakeholders, stakeholders like central bank governor, their statements shows that they are not ready for that type of uh, no, uh, uh, solution. They are still adamant on this you know, so-called home-born mm. solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, what, what, is, what is your answer or what, what remedy do you think Sri Lanka has for, for this, um, for the remittances issue? Again, um, even the remittances that came into the country, they, they found alternative routes to get into the country and thereby there is, there is that uh, another crisis that Sri Lanka <laughs> has to manage. Uh, so, so what uh, remedy I, I, do I, I, you That is a part of the crisis, not a separate one. Now see, now Sri Lanka is now in a situation of the foreign exchange crisis. Mm -hmm. Now the senders, those who are working abroad, they observe it. So we call something called speculations. They speculate that if they send dollars to the formal channels, that may affect the assets. And therefore, they immediately try to find informal ways. So there are many different ways, like you know, uh, there are some institutions from formal informal ways of sending money to Sri Lanka without official channels. So what they do, they give money to their agents in the country where they live, and then they give a phone call to Sri Lankan agent, they give rupees. So there are no dollars coming in, only the rupees are coming in, and that may also give the impression further, because when the people have money, they start spending, so that goes to the uh, demand for inflation, what we learn in our uh, uh, students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that may actually, so this, uh, uh, what you said actually is a part of the dollar crisis. They immediately see that there's a uh, bad situation coming up and therefore they go for their speculations. So those right. this is a result of that speculation. Mm -hmm. um, again, Dr. Vijayawadana, um, if we turn to talk about the, the dollar rupee uh, situation, I'd like to, uh, this, the, the understanding is that this is not a situation created just within these past two years, but uh, due to inconsistent policies or the kind of policies that were implemented throughout uh, throughout the history of independent Sri Lanka. Um, as a former central banker, uh, what have you got to share with us? Again, uh, we don't have to look back at what uh, difficult or wrong measures we took, but going forward in uh, ensuring Sri Lanka has a stable uh, policy framework. We've been talking for years about consistent policy framework, but is it possible for us to go there now uh, when, when everything seems to be falling apart? Uh, in the very, the inconsistency in the policy that you are talking about has been the overprinting of money by the central bank throughout the uh, post independent history ever since central bank was set up in 1950. If you allow the money supply of the country to grow at the same rate as the real economic growth, you don't have this problem. But if the money supply has been increased simply because you want to meet the government financial requirements, there is an excess money available and that excess money would, in, a, in an open economy, would go out of the country by way of imports and purchase of various other products from other countries. So Sri Lanka had this particular problem since 1950 and if you examine the uh, the period of the past governments, the inconsistency in the policy that all the finance ministers at the time they uh, they present the budget in parliament, they, they, they promised the parliament that they will not, you know, uh, get money from the uh, these expansion resources from commercial banks and the central bank. But at the end of the year, if you sit back and examine what they have done is they have exactly done what uh, they had promised uh, that not to do. So this is what has happened to Sri Lanka's uh, exchange rate and exchange rate is under pressure for depreciation because there is a huge uh, gap in the balance of payments. This gap has been financed uh, in the past by successive governments by borrowing money from outside which has given birth to another problem called the foreign debt problem and when both the uh, the gap and the foreign debt problem get compounded then we have no other escape except allowing the exchange rate to depreciate in the market. But the government has been holding on to this magic 203 rupees per US dollar and uh, without uh, any facility or availability in the, within the central bank to uh, supply dollars to the market to maintain it at that level. 
So as a result, there's a shortage of dollars in the market. This shortage has created a huge and lucrative black market outside the banking sector. If you take the rates, uh, the official exchange rate of 203 rupees per US dollar and the black market rate at 240, 250 rupees per US dollar, premium is as high as now 40 to 50 rupees. So what it means is that the black market is thriving, it's growing up, it's not, it, the central bank cannot control it unless the central bank allows the exchange rate to move downward so that you will be gradually eliminating the black market. Okay. So this is where we stand today in the very and central bank chair cannot, in my view, hold to this 203 rupee magic number forever. Uh, pretty soon the central bank will have to allow the rupee to fall. When you allow the rupee to fall, it will be a free fall. And at that point, we don't know what would happen to Sri Lanka. Do you share the same uh, observation or view uh, or do you have anything to add, yeah, Professor Ranasinghe? I think that is what uh, all we can you know, understand from the current scenario. If you look at the balance of trade balance of Sri Lanka, the trade balance of Sri Lanka was actually fluctuating from 1950s mm -hmm. to 1977, uh, but with some positive and, uh, positive and negative uh, uh, these uh, numbers. However, there's a, it become negative after 1970, it started growing negative numbers are growing. Now you can see from this chart that uh, after this is uh, 19, uh, is a 2000, uh, 2001, mm -hmm. after 2000, there's a steady decline of the trade balance. Right. That is a one aspect of the story. Now actually this, we can question about this now because we have this uh, 1970 open economic policies uh, expecting that we can have more exports and more foreign resources, but it has not happened. It may happen, but uh, the amount of money that we spend on imports is always the uh, money we earn. So that's a, that's a question about the success of our strategies. And if you go to the uh, foreign direct investments, that's also uh, so a very interesting pattern. You see that here, the foreign direct investments are not that high, uh, up to 77. Mm -hmm. Uh, 77, that's a very high, sp uh, that's a uh, positive number and just may go. But again, after uh, year 2010-11, like, there's a sharp decline. Now, just because net uh, FDI negative, now it's going further down, up and downs. Now, the question here is that actually, what is this 2009-10? That was actually, uh, we have ended the war. And you know, there's some uh, sort of a business conducive environment was created. But immediately after that, we start declining this uh, foreign reserves, uh, FDIs. Mm -hmm. So what we expect is in a competitive market, if there are no war, no peaceful situation, there's no peaceful situation, we expect the more FDIs to come. But it's completely other way has happened. So what is the reason for that? It's the question that we should ask. Actually, we have been uh, not trying with various industrial policies uh, time to time from uh, late uh, Prime Minister Chandrika Bandar Nayaka's time, we have the import substitution policy, and after 77, we have uh, uh, export oriented policy. Now it seems that, so uh, Mrs. Bandar Nayaka's import substitution policy was there for five years' time. By the end of the five years' time, when the economy is open, those infant industries protected by the system were not able to compete. So they were completely destroyed. Okay. After 77, now we have nearly 50 years, very close to 50 years. Even now, the industrialist seeks the government incentives, various packages for them to survive. Other than very few large scale entrepreneurs, all others are highly relying on the government uh, quotas. Now there's a big question. Why do we have to that growth when we give the chance to the private sector over a nearly 50 years time to compete in the market? Hmm? Still, we are not competing. We are not strong enough to compete. Okay. We understand the world trends, but at least we should be able to little better than this. So my reading of this is that just the import substitution or the export oriented policies are not to blame. We have very bad, you know, sort of a governance system of the country. 
and also very inconsistent, as uh, uh, Dr. Vijayan mentioned, very inconsistent monetary and fiscal policies of the country. As those policies have discouraged, and also the our competitors like Vietnam, Thailand, even Bangladesh, they win over the race. Mm -hmm. They were able to attract our investors there, so we lost it, and therefore we are in sort of a very this. Actually, we have seen this. Foreign exchange, this uh, foreign reserve problem, we start seeing from 1970 to gradually going down. We have a few minutes. Okay, so I think that is what we uh, have to understand. So okay. we should have sort of a solid policy. So it is not a problem creator okay. right now, but due to the some sort of uh, inconsistent policies of the, I would say, the present government and all subsequent their regimes, we have aggravated that. Uh, Dr. Vijay Vardhana, a final few minutes uh, on the show, but uh, I think Professor Atula Ranasinghe did also uh, shared uh, his view that there is no short-term remedy um, to the current situation. And as we also understand, these are policies uh, taken over time, uh, over the past decades and years that are affecting Sri Lanka now, coupled with um, what's what's happening now. But really, what is the short to mid-term solution for Sri Lanka before we wrap up the show? Well, the, in the short run, in the very, we need foreign exchange to meet our foreign exchange commitments. If we take the total uh, commitments that we have within the next 12 month period, in respect of the repayment of external debt and payment of interest, we need about 7.2 billion US dollars within the 10th next 12 month period. Then the central bank is, you know, boasting about the increase in the exports without thinking of the uh, rise in the imports. They are actually talking about the gross inflows and not the net inflows. So if we take the entirety of the current account on the balance of payments, that will be actually in deficit by about, say, uh, 5 billion US dollars within the next 12 month time period. So we need another uh, 7 plus 5, 12 billion US dollars in order to overcome this particular liquidity problem that we are having today. For that purpose, it is necessary Sri Lanka to have this mega type of uh, foreign exchange inflow into the country. For that purpose, what the central banks can do is to get the IMF support first build up confidence among the foreign investors in Sri Lanka, in the in the central, in the Sri Lanka government's sovereign bonds. And finally, uh, to use the uh, short term uh, soft facilities that it is seeking after from the friendly central bank in order to go through the current uh, difficult situation. So this is what it has to do, but uh, in the long run solution depends on our reform in Sri Lanka's economy, which is a must uh, in, in the case of an IMF facility, allowing businesses to thrive, and also at the same time, uh, getting Sri Lanka linked to the rest of the global economy through an effective supply chain uh, connection. And those are the things that we have to do in medium to long term in order to have a permanent solution to this problem. So our short term one is to get enough foreign exchange to the country in the immediate future. The medium to long term solution would be uh, getting the Sri Lankan economy to move ahead, move, move up to the potential economic growth by having the necessary economic reforms in place. So that is what we have to do with the world. Thank you very much for your time. We had with us, uh, joining us virtually, uh, Dr. W.A. Vijayawadana, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much for your time here. And uh, we also had with us uh, Professor Atula Ranasinghe, Senior Professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Colombo. And today we discussed uh, how Sri Lanka can navigate through the, the current difficult times. Um, we'll see you next week at the same time with another episode at Hyde Park on Adha Dharana 24.